So, hello everyone, and uh, thank you for coming out here tonight. My name is Enrico Campidoglio, and I work as a consultant at Triton 37. I'm mainly a .NET developer, but I've done development in other languages as well, like Java and uh, yeah, even C++. Tonight, I would like to talk to you about BDD. So let's talk about expectations first. So how many of you in the audience are developers? Good, 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 good. And how many of you are programmers? Great. Do you know the inofficial difference between a developer and a programmer? That a developer, they write code to create value for a company. Programmers, they write code because they love code. So it doesn't really matter what the subject is. No, I'm just joking. So, um, well, that's great. And how many of you have heard of BDD before? How many of you are doing it uh, regularly? Great. Then it's good that you're here, because I'm going to show you how to do it in practice. So, first, what is this talk about? This talk is about how to apply the techniques and the principles of BDD in practice. So it, there are a lot of code examples here. And I'm going to use .NET and C Sharp as, my, as the language for the examples. But of course, the principles that I'm talking about, they can be applied to any technology, really. But let me just check how many of you are .NET developers. Oh, well, that's good, that's good. But if you're doing Java, that will be almost the same. If you're doing Perl, not so much. Uh, and how are we going to do that? We are going to do that by implementing the first rule of the game of life. Are you familiar with the game of life? Okay, a few. So a game of life briefly is a, a, a logic game or a mathematical game, either one, that consists of uh, a grid of cells. And this grid of each cell in the grid can be either alive or dead. And the game is about refreshing this grid with each new generation of cells. What decides if a cell is alive or dead from one generation to the other is based on four simple rules of the style if, then rules. What we're going to do tonight is to implement the first rule of Game of Life, BDD style in .NET, okay? But first of all, let's talk about what is BDD. So it's a software development technique, mostly. And it, kind, it comes from TDD, that is test-driven development. But why do we have BDD when we already had TDD? What's the difference there? The difference is that BDD has been thought out to bridge the gap between developers or programmers and the stakeholders, so the people who care about what the system is actually doing, not how it's constructed. Because these two kind of people have different interests in the same project. And there was a clear need of finding a way to bridge that communication gap. And BDD is about that. But why? Why wasn't it just good enough with TDD, with test-driven development? What is the first rule of TDD? The first rule of TDD is you should never write a single line of production code if you don't have a failing test. And that's all it says. It doesn't tell you where to start with your tests, how to name them so that they are, they are readable. It doesn't tell you how to understand when they fail. It just simply tells you you should write your, your test first. So BDD is about focusing, is about doing TDD with a focus on what the system is supposed to do and test that with your tests. And something else, because if you focus on the functionality and the behavior of a system, you naturally, comes, you naturally come to define a dictionary of words that are specific to the domain where the system is being built. And that's, about, that's exactly the point about bridging the communication between developers and stakeholders. Because by focusing on the functionality and the behavior, 
you naturally need to answer some questions like what is a customer for you or for you or for you? What do you mean by a customer? What do you mean by an order? And those, ex those explanations that come out of the discussions, they help developers understand the domain better. They help the stakeholders formalize better what they want the system to do. And in the process, we create this dictionary of words so that when we say customer, everybody knows what we mean by customer. So it's a process that leads to this, this lexicon. But how do we apply it in practice? Because all these, these principles, they, they sound good and nice, but when it comes down to working in a real project, how do we do that? We do, the, we do it by, let me just uh, roll, roll back a little bit. Traditionally, system development was, was seen as a metaphor for a, software con for a building construction. So the software architect was a metaphor for the construction architect, architect and the system was like a building. So that in the, in the traditionally, software development was seen as you build layer by layer by layer. You, f you first start by digging a hole in the ground and you lo lay the foundation and you start building your house or whatever that is. And the software development was pretty much treated the same way. But that turned out to be not so a good idea. Why? Well, because of course if you're building a house and you're halfway up, you realize that you did something wrong in the, f in the, f in the foundations, it's kind of hard to address that. We're going to have to destroy what you've done and rebuild it again. In software, we don't have to do it that way if we don't want to. Software is malleable. It's not like uh, something physical that once it's been constructed, it's, it's hard to undo. In software, you can undo stuff pretty easily. So why should we stick to this meta metaphor of buildings? Why instead, why not instead go over to another metaphor, the metaphor of growing. So do not build your system, grow it. Much like a plant or a flower. So a small flower doesn't have many, many colors or many leaves, but it's still a flower in its entirety. And then it grows and it adds more features. More leaves, it, get, it, gets, it get, gets bigger, but in the process it's always a flower. You can't have half a flower, right? So in BDD, we build systems incrementally by adding a feature that goes all the way through the system, a very, very tiny, a very slice, tiny, uh, um, thin slice, sorry. And you keep growing the system like that while in the process, you keep it working all the time, okay? But when, wh when you start out by building a new system, and you don't have anything to start with, what do we do then? We build a so-called working skeleton. What is a working skeleton? When you design your system, you think about what is the simplest task that this, this system can do, the most basic, the, basically the hello world, so that we can use it as an excuse to put in place all the infrastructure we need to build the, the, f the system in the long run. Okay? So, you find the, the simplest task you can implement that is real behavior, is real functionality, but very, very, very basic, basically a small flower. And you use it as an excuse to drive the, 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 the development of the infrastructure, the tests, the automation, the build automation, and all this stuff. When you have that in place, you basically have a system that doesn't do much, but it's an entire system all the way through. So it's basically a skeleton a working one because it, uh, it can actually do stuff, it works. Let's get even more concrete. How do we do that in practice with this BDD? We start by writing a failing end-to-end -end test. What is an end-to-end -end test? Is a test that exercises the system all the way through, all the way down, okay, from the top. Because when you do BDD, you naturally work from the outside in. So you start by putting yourself in the shoes of the user or the stakeholder, because that's where the functionality is. They know what the system is supposed to do. So let's pretend we are them and understand what they mean and build from there 
all the way down through the system. So you start from the, from the outest post. It could be a user interface, it could be an API, it doesn't really matter, as long as you are the user. You write a test that of course will fail, and then you park that and you start implementing one level below the surface. Then you are down at unit test. You start implementing components. At, at that level, we're not writing end-to-end -end tests anymore. We're writing unit tests. Of course, that is going to fail. Then you make it pass. Then you refactor. And you keep going through the cycle just as normal TDD. And after you've implemented the feature in its entirety, we go back to the end-to-end -end test and run it again. Does it pass? If yes, then we have implemented a feature. So at this point, we are sure that if we pass that initial user perspective test, the system actually does what it's supposed to do. There is no question about it. Okay? So that's called outside-in. What I'm going to show you now with code is exactly this process by using the game of life as an example. Okay? So, of course I'm gonna have to log in. And let's hope I'm not lock myself out. All right. So here I'm in Visual Studio, which is the development environment for .NET. And uh, I have my basic solution over here. That's basically organized into uh, a web project. That is the actual web application. Then we have the acceptance tests, those outside tests we were talking about. And then we have the unit tests. So that's basically it. If we further take a look at the acceptance test project, we see two interesting things. We have the scenarios and we have the steps. In the scenarios folder, I'm going to put a file for each feature that the system is supposed to do. That, if you're doing uh, some kind of agile methodology, that could actually map to a user story. You could have a feature file for each user story. So here I have uh, my uh, rules.feature. By the way, the tool I'm using it to write this kind of tests is called Specflow. Is anyone of you familiar with Specflow? Okay, a few of you. Specflow is a tool that allows you to write tests in natural human language. That could, no, doesn't have to be English either. It could be any, there are the localization for many languages. So you write your tests in a formal way, but to do it as natural languages. Of course, in order to execute a test, you will need uh, some kind of tool that can map those sentences into code. And that's exactly what Specflow does. So let's start by writing this feature. Here I'm saying that you see that the terms are actually the, the same terms that we normally use uh, in, uh, when doing user stories. So the purpose, in order to display the current state of the universe as a consumer of the game of life, I want to obtain the next generation of cells. Now let's observe a couple of things here. We have the word universe over here. We have the word generation here. We have the word cells. So already here, I'm defining the vocabulary. Because of course, if some stakeholder will tell me these things, I will wonder, what do you mean? What is a generation? What is the universe? What is a cell? And by, having, by getting the explanations back, we start this process of defining the concepts. So you see how BDD forces me to do that up front. So let's write the first scenario. Now, in spec flow terms, each feature, feature is made up of scenarios. If we want to map that into agile terms, that will be a user story is made up of many acceptance criteria. So for this user story to be considered uh, done, all of the acceptance criteria must be passed. 
Okay? So, the first rule of game of life, what does it say? It says that it's called death by underpopulation. Okay? So, given that we have a live cell with fewer than two live neighbors, when we ask for the next generation of cells, that cell does not survive. It's dead. So that's actually the first rule of game of life. There are three more of them. They are basically roughly similar, based on the number of living neighbors and the state of the cell itself, it will survive or die. So that's the first rule. You see the set test is organized in uh, given, when, then, and that's the formal part. That's what BDD has, has formalized. We should, we should have a, st a standard formal way of expressing our requirements. And why not use the word given for the premises, when for the action, and one or more thens for what we want to assert. Okay. So now, now this doesn't, doesn't do much, of course, because there is no code bounded to those steps. So what specflow can do is that it can generate methods that map to those, uh, those steps. We can do that uh, right from Visual Studio by doing, uh, by, by use, sorry, by using the generate step definitions over there. And let me show you this. So here you have which steps do you want to generate code for? And how do you want to do that? We're going to have those method names with underscores, okay? Let's copy them to the clipboard. Then I usually do it like that. that for each feature file, I have a corresponding C sharp file. And in that C sharp file, I, it's a basic a normal class. I have my methods, okay? So you see, these are normal C sharp methods that are tagged with given, when, and then and they're named with the same words as the step, but you have underscore in the middle. And that's the convention that step specflow can use if you want to map those into those, okay? So let's save that. And by the way, let's tell specflow that this file actually contains steps. When we save it, you see that they are no longer read because now there is code coupled to them. Of course, if we run this test, which of course we can do if we compile. So let's run this test and it's going to be inconclusive, right? Because there is no code coupled to anything. So it's yellow. So let's implement those steps. But first, I wanted to observe one thing. You see that the number two here is a different color than the rest. Because steps can actually contain parameters. After, after you build tests this way, you soon find out that it's kind of repetitive if you have the same step. If you need the same step in different scenarios, why should you copy paste that all over the place? So if you have a step that needs some kind of parameters to be used in different scenarios, why not just have them as parameters? So this, uh, this particular step have a variable number of living n live neighbors. So the corresponding method over here, it will have a parameter. Also note that, that it's automatically of type int. So no, 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 uh, no reason to cast. And you can call it anything as long as it's, uh, it's all caps. So let's write it, let's c call it count. And uh, is it okay if I decrease the font a little bit? I guess you, I guess you guys see pretty well already. <laughs> so, first step. Um, so, at this point, keep in mind that we are at the boundaries of the system. Don't look at the code. Look at me. We are at the boundaries of the system, 
there are no classes, there are no domain objects, there are no, and there is, there is actually nothing at this point. What we're building is a web API that is the game of life. We're going to build a new URL where you can post to a number, uh, a number of cells, a generation, a collection of cells. You post it to this URL and you get back a, back, you get back a new generation with the cells in different states. But at this point, there is no cell class, there is no cell object. What we need is to forge the request. So instead of uh, creating a class at this point will be far too early, let's just keep things dynamic, okay? So we take advances of the dynamic typing in .NET and there is in other languages to define that data structures without, without any types, without any classes. So a generation actually is an array of objects of cells, of course, but for us they're just objects. They are going to have two attributes, an alive attribute that can be either true or false, and a number of living neighbors. What does this step tell us? It tells us that given a cell that has fewer than a certain amount of live neighbors, a live cell. So, this, so at this point, all we need to do is um, create a generation that consists of one cell. We don't need any more than one. It's going to be alive and it's going to have the given amount of neighbors minus one, fewer than, okay? Fewer than the that number you specify here, it could be minus one. So that's the cell we start with. And that's our generation. Oh. Now let's implement this. Oh, sorry. So at this point, I should probably do this. And uh, let's keep it uh, dynamic. Next step. When we ask for the generation of cells. Now at this point we need to do an action on the system. It is a web API, so let's use a class that allows us to make a uh, HTTP request to an endpoint. And that's just an utility class, okay? So an important thing here, or important, is mostly nice, is that uh, those bind, those steps in, in uh, spec flow, they can actually have, uh, they support dependency injection, okay? So if you need other classes to do your work, you can just take them into the constructor. So in this, ca in this case, we need a client, there is an object that allows us to make post requests. So let's use it. We're going to post as JSON to this URL, the array that we have here. And we're going to have a response. Now let's see if I can do this. Yes. Uh, create local field. And the response is going to be of the type of HTTP response message. Going on, last step, then the, sh the cell should be dead. So, more work to do here. We get back the response, we parse out a list of cells, of course still dynamic, we don't have any cell. Here we are making some assumptions. We are uh, making an assumption that uh, the next iteration we, we get back contains exactly one cell because we sent one. Of course, uh, the generation must have the same number of cells that you sent in. Let's get the alive property out of that and the alive should be false. Ergo, the cell should be dead. So let's create field for that. And from now on, I'm going to alt enter my way through the presentation. No, not really. So, let's compile this and uh, let's run. Well, of course, no surprise, this is going to fail. But how does it fail? Let's take a look at it. So, here you can see the different steps. The given part, done, okay? The when part, done. The then part, there is an error here. What is the error? 
Well, the error is kind of a funky one. Cannot, cannot deserialize JSON object. What's that? Now, if I keep the test in this current state and it fails when I'm developing, I have no idea right, right away why it failed. So it just tells me that it can't deserialize the JSON object. So if you remember from before, one tenant of TDD is understand why a test fail immediately without debugging. So it turns out the test that as we have designed it right now, it makes some, a lot of assumptions. We need to be more specific. But first, let's do some refactoring, okay? Just because. Are you a follower of the clean as you cook uh, school? Any guys? Uh? Instead of when you cook, when you cook food, instead of uh, mm, throwing uh, all the pans uh, into the di into the, the dirty pan dirty pans and uh, the tools you use into the dishwasher, you you clean them as you wait for the food to to be done. So in the end, you don't have as much to clean. Clean as you cook. I know that not, not everybody, it's a problem if a couple, in, in a couple, one is following that school and the other is not. It can be kind of problematic. I apply the same ruling code. I clean as I develop, okay? It's kind of compulsory, uh, actually. Anyway, so let's extract this method because it, actually this doesn't tell me what it's, what it's doing. So let's extract that and say parse generation from response. Much better, right? Let's still run the test on one more time, just to make sure that we didn't break anything. Yes, still the same cryptic errors. So what we want to do is that instead of just asserting that the cell should be dead, let's be a little bit more specific. I should get back a new generation. Let's assert that. Let's make sure that we get back actually a generation. It should have the same number of cells that I, as I gave, and the cell should be dead. So you see, it can combine multiple dens. So same story as before. Generate step definitions. Let's do the underscore dens. Let's go in here and just paste them right here in the middle. So more methods also tags with them. Sorry. First thing, we should get back a new generation. So first, we should get a positive response. It should be an HTTP 200 OK. If we don't get that, we have a problem in the system. So let's assert that up front. Then let's parse the generation from the response, and let's make sure that it's not null. So we're actually getting out a generation. Next step, it should have the same numbers of, of cells. So the next generation, it should have a count equal to one. Of course, it, this could be a parameter, if you want. That comes from here. And then we keep what we had before, with the one difference, we don't have to parse it again because we already done it in the previous step. So let's remove this line. Now let's run the same test again. Running, running. You see, this actually take time. So much better, much, much better. It failed already here at the first then. How did it fail? Look at it. We expected a response between 200 and 299, sorry, 200 and 300, but we got a 404, which is exactly what we expect. There is nothing answering to that endpoint, that URL. There is nothing on the other end. We should get a not found. So now we have a failing acceptance test and end-to-end -end test that uh, fails in the expected way. Let's park, the, let's park that and start the unit test TDD cycle to implement this feature all the way down, okay? Now, of course, we could write those unit tests in uh, multiple ways, but this talk is called BDD all the way down, so we are going to stick to the BDD style of expressing the tests also for unit tests, not just at this level. 
And for that, we're going to use another framework. Frameworks, you know, frameworks all over the place. Uh, I have uh, one project uh, dedicated for the test. It's called test, not so strange. <laughs> and I have one folder. Let me use those highlighting features some more because I like them. I have one folder for each project. And uh, for each folder in the project, I have a corresponding, uh, corresponding map over here. Oh, sorry. Too much enthusiasm. So, and so. So that's how I usually stru structure my unit test. You don't have to do that. Now, I guess that if you have been, been, uh, been doing unit testing for a while, I'm guessing that you're probably doing one test class for each production code class, right? Wrong. And you probably call that class the same name as the class you're testing plus test. Yes. If you're doing uh, testing with BDD or following the principle of BDD, organizing it that way doesn't really tell you what the expected behavior is if you look at the class. So here we implement it in a different way. Instead of having one test class per class, we have one test class per scenario, per feature. Okay? Let me show you how, what I mean by that. So first let's create a, a folder that will contain all the tests for a certain class. So we are going to write a generation controller tests. Okay? because the class we're going to write is called generation controller. Inside here, we are going to write a, a class that is called, instead of generation controller test, we're going to call it when calculating, calculating the next generation of cells. So one test class per functionality. Already here, I know what I'm going to test because it's behavior. I, I state it right in the, to the test. And uh, let's make this, uh, this class public. Now the tool I'm using for write this kind of test is called MSpec. Anyone familiar with MSpec? Yeah? Or machine specifications. It's a unit test framework, much like any unit or X unit or MS test. Well, what it gives you is that it gives you a, a syntax on top of C sharp to express your test in a BDD way. And the way you normally do that is that you inherit, I know, it's kind of a bummer, you have to inherit from other classes that give you some context up front. So you end up with long inheritance chains which I know is not nice, but it's the, I think it's a low price to pay for what you get. So let's inherit from a class called with subject of the type generation controller, not tests. So more alt enter. By the way, are there any TDD purists here? Just checking, because at this point, someone will say, why, why do you stop here? You haven't written the full test before you start implementing. Well, another school says that not compiling is also a failed test. It's actually your fa first failed test. So right now I can't continue because I can't compile. So let's make it compile. Let's create a class. Now we passed. Okay, so let's, let's go on. First, let me get rid of that, you know, clean as you cook. So, first part of the test, more alt enter. Do you guys use really sharper a lot? Yeah, great. Alt enter, it should be called alt enter driven development. Anyway, right, right at this point, we're at a unit test level, remember that? So we can actually start mentioning entities, classes, because we are inside the system, no longer outside the system. So this is actually the first time we mention the word cell, where we actually create a class for the 
why should I want it internal? Why? So we create a class called cell, and we create uh, a field or a property. Domain-driven design purists? No? Actually, TDD says you should write the least amount of code possible to make a test pass. I don't actually don't need a property right now. Could be a field. Oh, I hear the screams. What, do you, what are you doing? We need properties. So let's create a field. And you see, Alt Enter all the way. Actually, let me, let me move this thing up a notch. So we create one cell that is alive and has exactly one live neighbor, just like we did on the acceptance test. Here I'm doing something strange. I'm saying many, including my solitary cell. What this method is doing is that it's automatically generating a bunch of cells. I don't know how many, but they are cells through reflection. And it's going to include this one in the list. This is another tool called Auto Feature, but I'm not going to talk to you about that. So let's create the list of cells and let's uh, move it up, please. So this seed is going to be a list of an X number of cells. We don't know how many. Introduces kind of rando randomality, if it's that even a word. So we don't hard code anything. But in that list, is we go we're going to have our cell. And that's called established context. That will uh, roughly correspond to the given part. Let's establish the context. Then let's make the when part. And in MSpec, it's called because of. Because really. Here, you could write anything. You could write people if you want. But let's stick to the convention. And say because of. Establishing this context, because of. I invoke a method on my controller. Method doesn't exist. Let's create that. And it's going to return an enumerable of cell. And it's going to contain, have a parameter of, you get a generation, you return a generation. Okay? Let's save the result to a field. You're following along. Okay, just scream if, you, if you're not. Because we, we, are, we are so few, so we can actually, you know, no, we can actually ha have it as a conversation within 50 minutes. So let's make this, um, let's see if it compiles, yes. And then we start asserting. So we have one given, one when, and then we can do many then. And then, then, in MSpec, is called it should. Actually, not this one. Let's do this one. It should return the next generation of cells. That's our first, our very basic, what's the most basic thing we can do at this point? It's to assert that we get a generation back. So the next generation should not be empty. You see how the API here in, is moving away from the traditional assert, true, assert, equal. We're appending stuff using should as a sentence. Everything should read as specifications, as requirements, using the words of the domain and read like specifications. I want you really to remember that because that's a, the whole point of this session is showing you what BDD is about expressing requirements in code. So, any guess how should we make, uh, let's run the test first to see it fail. Yes, it fails because should not be empty, but is empty. Actually, let me put this test into a new, uh, so we don't have the noise from the other test. So let's make this test passed. Any guess? I'll take any guess. What's the least amount of code to make this test pass? TDD style, blind, not caring about the software development practices of the world. Let's just return an array of one with null. We just are going to make this test pass, right? Okay. 
So let's run it again. Passed. TDD cycle. Failed gr red, green, refactor. Right now, we don't have really much to refactor. So let's keep going. Next test. This generation that we get back, it should include our original solitary cell, the one that has fewer than two live neighbors. It should be included in what we get back. Otherwise, there is no point. So, of course, this test is going to fail. Let's make sure we understand why it fails. Should contain exactly this cell. Of course, if we override to string, we're going to get a nice, we can make it appear as we want. But the list contains null. So, <laughs> completely overstating things, it does not contain that cell. Let's make it pass. Now we start getting into the logic that we want to implement. Because to make, to make sure that that cell is included, we're going to select it. So from the seed, where, so I'm using link here, where the cell is alive and, oh, smiley, oh, more smiley, and the neighbors are less than two, well, let's just return that, right? Of course, the, the one who's paying attention the most is seeing that these are already green. So there is no surprise when I tell you that this test is passing. So let's open that parenthesis. What is this green stuff? When you're doing TDD, I find it useful, instead of manually running the test at every stage, to have something that does that for me. And so in this case, I have a tool called nCrunch. What nCrunch does is on uh, Visual Studio add-in, it runs all your tests all the time as you write code. You don't have to run anything manually. This code continues testing, kind of. So I have this green indicator which uh, satisfies my need of control that tells me is everything okay or not, okay? Next test. Any guess on the, what the next test should be? I will take guesses, but I will follow my script. <laughs> this generation should not only include our solitary cell, but also the other ones. And we don't know how many there are. So we're going to make sure that the next generation should contain only the cells that are in the seed. It shouldn't add anyone, it shouldn't remove anyone. They should be exactly the same as the ones I sent in. And this does not pass. Can, we can see already. Let's make sure that we understand why. Oh, lots of text. So, we should have four cells because that method that was called many including actually made three cells, in this case, plus the one we know about. So there should be four. What we get back is just a solitary one. So we're missing three. Exactly as expected. So how do we make this test pass without undoing this? Let's just say, and let's add the rest, okay? Let's select the, the one that's candidate for being dead, the solitary one and add all the remaining ones. Passed. Now for the last one, I know that you know, TDD is not, uh, is not really entertaining to watch. And I've seen videos on YouTube of people doing TDD, I end up sleeping. Because it happens mostly in the head, right? Last but not least, let's make sure that cell is dead. Okay, so alive should be false on the solitary one. Now we made sure that it's included, we have the rest, now let's make sure that it's also dead. And it's not, of course, because we haven't changed it anything. So is dead, should be false, but it's true. 
because we haven't changed the state of the cell. So what should we do here? Let's start, sorry, let's start by having these ones as, uh, we are going to call them underpopulated cells. And we are going to move the union over here. Now it's going fast, moving fast, just to make room for, so we select the ones, sorry, we select the ones that are candidate to be under, that are underpopulated. Here we're going to do a nice for each. Oh, enter, enter. For each cell in the underpopulated ones, let's say alive equals false, then return them and add the rest, okay? So we have evolved the implementation to actually kill those that are underpopulated. Let's run the test, pass. Let's run all of the tests, passed. So at this point, we have actually implemented the rule, the first rule of game of life, selecting the underpopulated cells and killing them. But this code looks like crap, so sorry for now. So let's refactor it pretty quickly. This should actually be a method, and let's call it underpopulated cells, so actually a good guess. What is this part doing? This, doing, this part is actually killing the cells, right? So I'm just extracting methods out of the main one to make it more readable. So this, met this method operates on a list of cells, which by the way are not necessarily underpopulated. Just killing cells, too much. Instead of operating on the input, let's return a new one. So we have input cells, processing, and returning, okay? Instead of operating on the um, Instead of operating on the input, we process the input and we return a new list. Oh, we broke a test, of course, because we have to assign the result. You see how ncrunch is running all the time over here? So now I'm actually, I actually broke a test because the dead cells are not the ones returned. Green, now I'm back to passing all the tests. So now that I've extracted those methods, I can actually start doing this. Okay, does this read better? Kill the underpopulated cells and add the rest. Okay, so I'm just, now that I have the test all, all running, I can start refactor the out of uh, this code, okay? And still, still making it pass. So, more refactoring. These classes shouldn't be in the test class. Let's move them out. Let's move this one in uh, web models. Let's move this one. I'm, going, I'm using MVC, by the way. So this will really be into the controllers. Otherwise, it's not going to work. I can promise you that. So let's run everything again. Actually, you can grow addi addicted to the green color. So, everything is passing. Remember what's the stage now? Now we're done with the TDD cycle. Let's go back to our initial acceptance test. And let's see if that works. Any guesses? Any guesses? We have a few more seconds. Oh my God, why? Oh, sorry. So what happened here is that we did, we, it didn't pass because it's still not found. Now at this point, I will normally start to cry because I, will, I was convinced that it was, this would work, but I wanted to keep this element in because we are dealing with, we are dealing with frameworks. So it's not all around sunshine and rainbows. It's not just code. We actually have to deal with the limitations of the frameworks we're, we're using. So in this case, Turns out that in MVC, if a controller doesn't inherit from a particular class, it's not going to answer anything. Okay? It must inherit from API controller in order to be an active controller in ASP.NET MVC. 
NTDD purists are screaming, what? You just added a production line of code without a failing test. So they're actually, and according to TDD, I should write a test that asserts that the controller inherits from that one. But is that behavior? No, it's not really behavior. It's an implementation detail. So let's not write the test. Now we can run our initial acceptance test and hopefully it's going to pass. So now we know that we have implemented the first solo game of life all the way down and the tests are pretty readable. From this level down to the unit test level. So let's wrap this up. What I want to, to take away from this session are actually three points. The first one, make sure that you test behavior. Do not test functionality. So understand what the system is going to do up front, formalize it, and then you start implementing. Second step, make sure you design a language, a common language across all the team members, both, both developers and stakeholders. And in the end, make sure that you write your tests in a readable manner so that they read like specifications. So these are actually the, the three points. Understand, for, define the language, and make your tests readable. So that, that, that's the, the essence of BDD. Now, BDD, I should have probably mentioned it at first, uh, was formalized amongst other by Dan North, who, who was here <laughs> uh, earlier this week. Was it, uh, was it this week? Yes. I, I was actually hoping or fearing that he would be here tonight so I could get his feedback on this one. Am I, am I getting it right? <laughs> um, so at that link, uh, you can actually read his first thoughts about BDD, how, it's going, how, how it came about the thinking process behind it. Then there is a good book about this outside-in testing that I'm, um, I've shown you, testing from the outside into the system by writing those uh, failing acceptance tests first, is in a book called Growing Object-Oriented Systems Guided by Tests. Say that three times fast. It's actually, the, the acronym for that is GO, GOAT, no, sorry, GOOSE. Growing Object Oriented Software. If you see that acronym online, they're actually referring to this book, G-O-O-S. A really, really good book. And if you want the code that I've shown you, it's up on GitHub. It's, uh, it's just a sandbox, nothing fancy, but you can see the code that I've been showing you tonight. And with that, I'd like to say thank you for your attention. And if you have any questions, we are not going to take them now because I don't have time, but afterwards. If you want to contact me, here are my uh, contact details. Thank you.